Health and Human Services Secretary Sylvia Burwell was in today's meeting. I spoke with her before she met with the president and asked her about the path forward on fighting the Zika virus if a bill is not passed before summer break on Capitol Hill. I think you know there are 2,900 cases of Zika in the United States, and we know that over 500 pregnant women have tested. So we keep focusing on the things we need to do in terms of keeping people informed, making sure tests are available, and that we're trying to control the mosquito. And at the same time, the funding is an important part of that. And I'm hopeful uh, that we can have a negotiation that can get us to a place where that funding comes through, because it's extremely important Without that funding in August, we won't be able to continue the next steps with regard to vaccine research. You know what Republicans are saying. They're saying we were there. We were across the finish line, and it was the Senate Democrats that blocked it. I mean, this is the back and forth of politics on the Hill, but your thoughts on all of that dealing with the real world consequences of the no funding? Well, the real world consequences for me are about making sure that we're doing everything we can for states, uh, and especially those states that are in the high risk area, those states in the South who tend to have this type of mosquito that will spread the disease. And we're working to do that, but we do need the funding in order to do that. Is the HHS coordinating with the USOC ahead of the Rio Games? So we're in close contact with the uh, United States Olympic Committee in terms of providing them the technical assistance and advice. Obviously, they're doing their interaction with their athletes, but we are there and making sure we're making suggestions for how they think about protecting the athletes as they go down. The Republic Republicans are pointing to this level three travel alert, that it hasn't been raised to that. Is that because of the sensitivity of the games, or is it has not reached that level yet? What we have done is we've been very clear about those we're most concerned about. And the disease Zika, most people in terms of when they get it, about 80% don't know you have it. And if you do have it, your symptoms are a fever, a rash, conjunctivitis, or pink eye, and some joint pain. So it's not severe. The severe issue is that it causes birth defects. It's the first time we've seen a mosquito-borne disease cause birth defects. So our travel guidance is if you are pregnant, you should not go to the regions where Zika is spreading. For others, we recommend that you take the appropriate precautions and also for the men who are returning because this can be spread sexually, making sure they take precautions when they return from those countries so if they got Zika. I guess it's the last part there that we just don't know yet fully all the elements of this virus. I mean, I, I see some athletes deciding, you know what, I'm not going to do it because they have young families and they want to have babies going forward. We don't know everything, but right now I think we believe and our recommendations are for men who have had Zika that they need to wait at least six months. Uh, what we recommend is six months in terms of use of condoms or refraining from sex if they are, uh, if someone is about to get pregnant or they are trying to impregnate. Your hope is that this politics can be worked up on, on the Hill. You know, Are I'm you an talking optimist? to anybody? Uh, you know I'm an optimist, and I've been that way since I've been here, uh, since I came back. It's a tough you know, environment to be an optimist. It is, but I believe that when people sit down in a room and get together, and that's an important part, that you can work through these things. And you know what? The other part, reason I'm an optimist is this is the need that the American people have right now. And I believe that's what we're all here to do. I want to ask you about Obamacare and where things stand. It's going to be a big political issue. There are people in polls that say, I don't know if I can take these premiums. They're killing me. Obviously, there's a side that says you've insured more people. But your assessment right now as HHS secretary of where things stand. So my assessment about the Affordable Care Act is it was about three things. Affordability, access, and quality. And with regard to access, we've made historic reductions. The 20 million people who now have insurance that didn't have it before, the fact that your kids can be covered up to 26, and the fact that we have the lowest uninsured rate that we've had as a nation. So access, good progress there. With regard to the questions of affordability and quality, these are both places where we know we want to do more work, but there have been improvements through the Affordable Care Act. Whenever there's a premium increase, we know people feel that. And so we have to keep working. Progress has been made, but there is more to do. Right. But isn't there a concern that the costs of this law to taxpayers could be much more than originally projected, and that the subsidies are not going to 
cover people and they're going to essentially leave the marketplace. What we've seen in terms of the Congressional Budget Office estimates, we've come in much lower in terms of the costs and that's something that we'll see over time. You are correct that when premiums go up, subsidies will, but we are still under those costs and the premiums themselves in the marketplace are still under those two. But for the vast majority of Americans who are in employer-based coverage, for those folks, the quality of coverage and the things that are very important in terms of pre-existing conditions, and most folks know somebody who's had cancer or something else, and if they ever have to make a switch, they don't have to worry. We chose a random city on healthcare.gov, a family of four in Lincoln, Nebraska makes $80,000. They can get a silver plan for about $600 a month in premiums after subsidies. Now it estimates the annual cost to be more than $11,000 a year. That's more than 13% of their income before taxes. So how is that affordable? For so them? what I think is important to remember is for that family before, without the subsidy and without the assistance, they wouldn't have access to it. And if they had a child that had asthma, for instance, they wouldn't have access. And that's what's different now. While improvements have been made, there's more work to do to get to the place where affordability is felt by all. How many co-ops will remain at the end of the year? I think at this point we don't know uh, how many there will be. The co-ops were an important part of the competition in the early stages. But one of the things, One of the things about the co-ops when you think about it, it's a different business model and that's something that new companies I think are strugg have struggled with. Some have been very successful. Uh, but the co-ops had a couple things as they began that were challenging. A lot of health insurance companies are now joining in this lawsuit against the administration to say that um, essentially they're not going to get their money out. Uh, and Republicans are charging that the administration tried to do something illegal, unconstitutional, by uh, using different money to pay the insurance companies. What What is the real result there? I mean, was it in illegal action to kind of shift that money around? There have been a lot of uh, court challenges that you know have gone through and uh, we continue to have those but as they go through I think you've seen that those are cases that we win. We believe we have the authorities. One of those suits you mentioned has to do with something about cost sharing and, and that's one of the things that creates affordability. It will be a political issue. I know you're optimistic um, but for Republicans who say they want to unwind this thing mm -hmm. How difficult is that, and is it more of a reality they're going to be fixing this structure? So I think that right now it, it, isn't, it is about what people feel and believe, and I think most people in the country don't want to go back to a world where pre-existing conditions could prevent you from getting care. And for the 20 million who have insurance, I don't think we want to go back, and I think that's what will be defining. And even the nation's largest insurer leaving the market, you think this is still sustainable as it is? So that particular insurer, in terms of uh, their decisions. There are a number of other that represent a much larger portion of the marketplace that have made statements that they're in and they want to work through and many of them have expressed that they want to grow. And so what I think is most important is we focus on that outcome for the American people which is people getting quality affordable coverage. Secretary Burwell, we really appreciate you coming in. Thank you so much for having me, Brett.